Hi, my name is Jacqueline Huskison and I am the your programmer for Elephant Artist Relief and welcome to our Umbrella Talks for 2020. Um, to start this uh, event off, I would like to give an land acknowledgement. Um, in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, we honor and acknowledge Mokinsis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kanai, Pekani, as well as Nakoda and Tsutsina nations. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. And finally, we acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play on this land, and who honor and celebrate this territory. The sacred gathering place provides us with an opportunity to engage and demonstrate leadership on reconciliation. Thank you for your enthusiasm and commitment to join our team on the lands of Treaty 7 territory. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, for, um, which is Sue Ying Strang. Sue Ying Strang is an artist and cultural worker based in Mokinsis, Calgary. As a guest on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. Originally hailing from the Southern United States, Strang relocated to Canada in 2006 to pursue her education at the Alberta College of Art and Design, now AU Arts. In addition to Strang's studio practice, she has been involved in the non-for-profit art sector since 2010. Strang is currently the director of the new gallery, the TNG, president of the Alberta Association of Artist-Run Centers, and a governor, governor on the board of the Glenville Museum. Strang's work in the arts is informed by the artist center and community-driven ethos, prioritizing strong stewardship of artistic practices and accessibility to programming for audiences. Strang's core focus for this work over the last several years has been in the context of TNG's location in Calgary Chinatown, which has included redefining the organizational's role in beginning in being a good neighbor and active participant in the community. TNG's work was recognized at the 2017 Mayor's Luncheon for the Arts, where the organization was presented with the Sandstone City Builders Award for making, a Calgary, for making Calgary a better place to live through the arts. Most recently, Strang's work was recognized by the Salzburg Global Forum for the Young Cultural Worker in, uh, for Young Cultural Innovators, where she was invited to attend as one of Canada's representatives at the 2020 Forum. Other recent awards and appointments include Avenue Magazine's Top 40 Under 40 Class of 2018 in Calgary, receiving the 2018 Alumni Horizon Award from AU Arts, and graduating from the inaugural cohort of the Band Center's Cultural Leadership Program in 2017. And before we get started with the arts tune up presentation with Sue Ying, I want to pass it off to Katie to give us a little intro on ear. I'm a treasurer from Elephant Artist Relief, and we are an organization based in Calgary that supports artists in crisis. We, um, we have been running for about 12 years now, and we would like to thank our, our sponsors, our Alberta Foundation for the Arts, CADA and Rose who support our programming such as this. Any donations that are given through our uh, Canada Helps link go straight to relief funds, which go straight to artists in need. And I'd like to, to introduce, is it back to Jill now or Jackie? I think it's me now. Okay, thank you for being here. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to be um, enjoying the, uh, the pleasure of interviewing Sue today. Um, so first of all, I'd like to um, mention, um, Jackie, sorry, I missed this. Did you mention about the questions, about people putting questions in the chat or saving them for later? They could either privately chat me, uh, message me, or they can just save it to the end for Sue. Okay, yeah. so Sue and I will chat for a little while and then we'll have time for, for questions later. Okay, thanks very much, you guys. So, Sue. Um, Hello. <laughs> hi there. So after that e extensive introduction, um, I'm gonna ask you for a few more 
question, a few more details about um, your history and uh, kind of the, the series of events that brought you to, to where you are right now. I mean, it's a, it's a complex picture, but um, I guess maybe in, in a nutshell, what, what brought you to where you are now? Um, absolutely. Uh, happy to expand. Uh, yeah, it's hard to fit life stories into biographies, I find. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's yeah. certainly uh, a lot of events and a lot of people who have led me to where I am today. Um, so yes, of course, as uh, I've been introduced, my name is Su Ying. Um, you can also call me Sue. My pronouns are she, her. And uh, thank you all for so much for having me uh, here. I really appreciate being here and, and sharing with your audiences. Um, and to Jacqueline for organizing this talk and all the behind the scenes work. Um, and of course, to all of you for attending over your lunch hour. So um, yes, please uh, feel free to be munching uh, on your lunch in the background um, and uh, typing or unmuting yourself and asking questions absolutely is great. Um, so I've been a guest here on in Mokinstis uh, on the traditional territories of Treaty 7 since 2006. Um, I'm originally from the Tokobaga, Utsita, and Pohoi um, and Mokoso territories in the Tampa Bay region of Florida. Um, that's where I was born, but not the only place I was raised. Um, I've been really uh, all over uh, the South is where I grew up, uh, Southern United States. So Florida, Georgia, Texas, New Jersey. Um, it's not, New Jersey is not the South, but uh, ended up there for a little bit as well. Um, and I moved up to Mokinstis, Calgary when I was 18 uh, to go to uh, then the Alberta College of Art and Design, now called, of course, uh, Alberta University for the Arts. Um, just in terms of uh, land acknowledgements. If any of you are joining us uh, from a specific territory that you would like to acknowledge, you, I encourage you to use the chat function to do so now. Um, so in terms of, and that's a, that's a practice I learned from um, early days in the pandemic, uh, Common Field, which is a, a conference, a gathering, a national annual gathering of artist-run centers in the United States. Um, and I felt that that was a really great practice to kind of ground us while we're in these digital spaces. Um, also adding pronouns to uh, your name tag. That's another thing that I learned. If you want to add yours, you can do it by clicking the dot, dot, dot and uh, rename yourself um, if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, so what brought me here? I was really excited to come to Canada. Um, as an 18 year old, I think I was just ready for a bit of change. Um, ACAD, then ACAD, I guess I'll try to call them AU Arts now. Um, at the time, I thought uh, I was really interested in going to an art school. Um, art schools were fairly unaffordable across the states. Um, and I knew that there were these four uh, up here in Canada. Um, from just a series of portfolio days that I went to while I was in high school. And, and ACAD, uh, I had good conversations with them year after year and ended up um, receiving an entry scholarship for them and thought that that would be a great way to help make the, the kind of dream to go to an art school uh, possible. So I, I ended up selecting uh, AU Arts, um, or they selected me, I guess, and was really excited to come up here sight unseen, really. I'd never been to Alberta. To be honest, it was not on my radar. I really thought I'd been to Canada once. I'd been out, out west, Coast Salish territory, to Vancouver, Victoria, um, but had never been uh, anywhere else. And of course, knew a couple of the large city names, but really hadn't considered Calgary as a place that I might call home um, and when I came up here I was I was uh, it took me a couple years to get used to the winter and uh, a different type of city um, but I really slowly began falling in love with the community and community I think is really one of the things that um, helped me get involved with artist run centers um, and has kept me involved with artist run centers, um, which of course is gonna be the bulk of our conversation today. Um, so during my time at AU Arts, um, 
had a lot of really incredible uh, peers and instructors that um, I learned from throughout my four years there. Um, and in terms of my connection and introduction to artist run centers, that was really uh, Shelley Lett and Diana Sherlock, who were teaching a practicum course at the time. And I was just entering the final semester of my fourth year. Um, and I, I think I was a, a panicking a little bit. Um, I wasn't quite sure where I was going to be going next. And I was doing a practicum with them. I thought maybe education. Um, and they asked me if I had considered um, working at an artist run center before. Um, and if I would be interested in an internship with one. And I said, yes. And that internship happened to be with the new gallery. Um, I guess to rewind a little bit, uh, one of the things that was really interesting to me um, as I got involved in the new gallery and artist run culture is just how different uh, of a space um, it is and how different of a network that has been allowed to flourish here in Canada compared to other parts of the world, particularly in the United States. I think the artist run network is an incredibly um, kind of robust network up here in Canada, um, given the multiple levels of public sector support that you don't find um, in the States and also in, in many other countries. Um, so that was something that drew me to artist run culture. I wasn't uh, really aware of um, how uh, how much work was happening in this field. I was very familiar with um, kind of visiting commercial galleries, visiting museums, visiting larger public art galleries. Um, but I thought that it was a really unique and exciting offering to have these small and mid-sized arts organizations that um, were nonprofit models that paid artists. That was a whole new idea for me, this idea of paying artists um, as a young uh, kind of um, not yet graduated art student. And so really, we really was just excited about that. And I have to always remember and thank um, Diana and Shelley for that introduction, because without their encouragement, I, I really wouldn't um, be working. Uh, well, maybe I would have, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine and speculate, but um, they, they truly are the ones that um, introduced me and encouraged me to do this work. Um, and both of them, of course, have been so involved in Calgary's artist run culture throughout the years. So I undertook this, this uh, internship that must have been 2010, the winter of 2010, and I just loved it. And I wanted to stay involved. I had very little experience, of course. And so um, the staff at the time, um, Jessica McCarroll, offered me a, a volunteer coordinator role as a volunteer for um, after my internship finished. And I was in a pretty fortunate and privileged place where I was working a, a, a job um, that would let me, uh, while I was a receptionist, let me work on TNG projects as a volunteer um, while I was behind their desk. And so I felt really privileged um, to be able to say yes to that opportunity, although it was unpaid, and continue um, being involved with the new gallery for that first year after graduating. Um, that second year, uh, Jessica found some money and, and was able to offer me a very, very uh, small part-time contract as their volunteer coordinator for about five, 10 hours a month, um, which I was incredibly appreciative of. And it allowed me to continue kind of that commitment. Um, and in 2012, uh, there was pretty significant staff turnover. All three current staff at the new gallery left. Um, and um, the role of administrative director opened up and I, I, joined, uh, I joined in that position. And we shortly after, um, I, we, we lost uh, our other staff and I um, just have been involved ever since. Um, so that's how I became involved with the new gallery. I applied for this position after kind of being tangentially involved uh, in very small roles for about two years um, as an intern, as a volunteer, um, and then as a small part-time um, contract. And that time period gave me, let me have a little bit of time to really understand where the new, not only the new gallery was at, but where the other artist run centers across the sector were at. So places like Truck Contemporary Art, Untitled Art Society, um, Stride Gallery, Alberta Printmakers, and Media, uh, Quick Draw. Um, there's so many, right? Uh, and so I, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, MST, uh, Performative Arts Festival. And so I started to learn about all of these organizations, volunteer for them as well, get more involved um, as a recent graduate and, and develop those um, not only 
relationships, which is an incredibly important aspect of this work, but also um, just start gleaning some knowledge about how uh, artists run culture and artists run centers worked. Um, and that's really what set me up for uh, being able to take on a larger uh, leadership role at the organization in 2012. Um, and it's just all from there kind of expanded um, and really kind of been a, a, my life focus over the last several years, um, but also just an absolute joy uh, to, to do. So maybe, I, ho I hope that was a comprehensive enough personal history <laughs> question. Yes, um, and let, please, if there's anything you want me to expand on, please let me know. No, I think that's good for, for now. Um, I see an opportunity to expand now is to um, ask you when that position sort of leaped into your involvement with um, the Alberta Association of Artist Run Centers. Because they, the whole, um, you're talking about, you know, coming from the states that had no artist run network, right? And then, and then coming here and finding, you know, the, the revelation of what is here. Um, so that gives you an interesting perspective right there, um, yeah. coming from a place that doesn't even have this. So then you work in, in an artist run, bleh, sorry, artist run center for a few years. And then you start working with this provincial organization. So I'm wondering when that started and how your, your position with both of those organizations works together and the kind of perspective it, it has given you. Yeah, great. That's a, that's a great segue. Um, and perhaps I'll start with just saying that um, my initial introduction to artist run centers, many years later, um, I would say only a few years ago, did I start to learn about the robust network of artists led organizations, although not necessarily what we think of in Canada as artist run centers mm -hmm. um, across the states that operate in all sorts of different models to kind of create an artist centered organization, but with very different operating uh, models, very different statuses, um, given the kind of lack of public sector funds um, that that we see in the United States for the arts. Um, so I mentioned common field later. So I, I misspoke actually when I said that um, there is no network of artist run centers. There's just a very different looking network of artist run centers. Um, and I think that all over the world, you'll see um, these, these models that are very much uh, artist collectives or artists at the center, um, but they just look a little bit different from kind of the well-funded and now institutionalized artist-run model that we see here in Canada. And um, being introduced to Common Field a, a few years back really opened my eyes to um, how artists are embedded in organizations in so many different capacities. Uh, so I just wanted to backtrack and, and um, say that. Um, but in terms of the Alberta Association of Artists Run Center and the new gallery, um, I actually got involved with them right away. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, as soon as I became full-time staff um, director of the new gallery back in 2012, um, that's really when, when I joined. Um, so it's, the model, the Alberta Association of Artist Run Centers has been around for about two decades now, I would say. And that, um, like the early mid aughts, um, that organization was founded to be kind of a communication network and advocacy network of artist run centers across the province and the provincial caucus of the national organization, the Alberta or the artist run uh, centers and collectives conference, um, which uh, brings together all of these regional and identity based hubs across Canada. Um, and so it's traditional, traditional for one of uh, the staff to sit on the board of the Alberta Association of Artist Run Centers, all member organizations. So currently we have nine of us. Um, and, and so I was asked as I joined, um, and I mentioned earlier that the year I joined, um, right before I joined, two staff had just left. Um, and then the final staff was uh, on their way out. They left about three months afterward, after I started. Um, let me at least get settled. <laughs> um, and so I think that uh, I was asked to join as part of my job responsibilities at the new gallery. Um, I did, and that was 
really integral to uh, getting grounded and, and building my understanding of what was happening in the sector um, because there were lots of folks involved on that board who acted as mentors and had a lot of knowledge about artist-run centers um, from, from their involvement. Um, here in Calgary, I'm thinking of like Renato Vidic, um, Lisa, um, <clears throat> Uh, from Stride and there's just so many folks that were generous with their knowledge sharing and resource sharing during those initial kind of years where I was really quite green and trying to learn. Um, perhaps it was my enthusiasm, um, but there was a vacancy on, for vice president on the board and they asked me at that annual general meeting that year if I would consider taking on that role um, with the intention of taking on the president uh, role in the following year. Um, and I said yes. And uh, so that was how my involvement started. It, it is a position that um, is within my overall role of the new gallery. I, I uh, help advocate on behalf of the artist-run community, um, and I and I connect and work with our peers um, quite frequently. So uh, that's how those two things are connected. Um, how they work together is they are separate entities. So the Alberta Association of Artists Run Centers is its own society um, and it has its own objectives and goals. Um, and that is quite collective and collaborative work um, amongst all of the member organizations. So artist run centers from both Alberta, but also surrounding regions that might not have a regional uh, uh, organization can join. Um, for instance, we've had members from Yellowknife before. Um, because there's, there wasn't a, a regional group up there. And we, we establish our own set of goals and work plans on that organization that are not the same as the new galleries, but run parallel, of course, to what we're experiencing um, as a sector. Okay, okay. How would you say in general, um, uh, if for any, if any people who are, are here, um, or who may view this later, if they're not familiar with the difference between an artist-run center and a commercial gallery, how would you characterize the difference between the two? Sure, well, in Canada, at least, um, a lot of the artist-run models that are publicly funded, I won't say all of them, but a majority of them are non-commercial, are non-profit, are not selling artwork. Um, so right off the bat, that would be one of the uh, significant ways that I'd characterize the, the difference between the two. However, we do see more um, grassroots uh, or younger organizations that start that are these hybrid commercial models that might not receive public funding or might see, receive project funding um, that also um, uh, bolster their operational support through either studio rentals or through commercial sales of artwork. Um, so it's not an all across the, it's not a, it's a generalization that artist run centers are generally non-commercial, but it's, it's not a hundred percent um, truth. <laughs> uh, there's, there's lots of iterations and models that folks follow. Um, but I would say most publicly funded artist run centers do utilize a non-commercial model. Um, and that's going back to the 60s and 70s with that first and second wave of artist-run centers really trying to be um, what they called parallel galleries um, or alternative galleries and spaces that could provide a venue and a platform for practices that were not being supported in commercial galleries or museums or larger public galleries at that time. Um, so I'm thinking about a lot of time-based practices, things like performance, a lot of new media work that was quite new at the time, whether it was video and photography. I mean, that's really where the new gallery is kind of initial mandate, um, then the Clouds and Water Gallery um, and the Sanctious Coffee House really started uh, as a, a performing space, a, a space for performative practices and photography primarily. Um, of course, that mandate has shifted and changed over the years. Um, but there was this real kind of need from artists to create spaces that were not just about um, functioning as another arm of um, or outlet for the market, but uh, as, a, as a space for 
experimentation, as a space for agency and autonomy for artists. And so you often see a lot of artist run centers, again, this is a generalization, it's not across the board, um, that are showing practices that are uh, still typically may be considered non-commercial, whether it's uh, installation based or again, new media based, um, because there's a space, uh, artist run centers as a platform that can not only share that work with the public, but also pay artists to do so. Um, so when you go to a commercial gallery, typically you're not being paid a car fact fee to uh, share your work there um, because you're receiving the sale, the whatever the commission minus the commission, the sale of your artwork. Um, in an artist run center, acknowledging the fact that you're not typically selling your work within the space, um, you receive a artist fee in lieu, uh, a Carfax fee. Um, there's a fee schedule, I'm not sure. I can drop the link in a little bit later in the chat if any of y'all are interested in seeing what the fee schedule is. Um, it's not a union, but it essentially is a schedule of best practices of what artists should be paid to recognize their professional contributions um, to, to the world to our audiences. And so that's everything from a fee for installing your work, a fee for giving a talk or a workshop, a fee for showing your artwork to the public. Um, and they have a whole kind of range of um, pieces that go along with that based on the institution size, um, the t where the work is being shown. Is it being shown in a traditional gallery? Is it being shown um, on a say a billboard or on like a banner on a bench or et cetera, et cetera. And so they have a bunch of different intersections of how those fees are calculated. Um, so one thing I always like to flag is if you're being invited by a public institution to uh, do any artistic labor, whether it's yeah a workshop, a talk, a, an exhibition, and they're not offering to pay you, that's something you should ask them in your negotiations and, and your ask. It's um, it's considered best practices, and if they're funded publicly, um, typically it's a, a mandate for them to be using those public funds to also um, be able to support and pay artists for their work. Work. Um, so that's a, that's an important distinguish uh, distinguishing factor. Um, I would say these days commercial galleries have shown lots of experimental work and have I think taken a lot of the kind of community community centered and artist led approach that a lot of artist run centers do. Um, a lot of these commercial galleries are run by um, folks who are very much involved with artist run culture and very much uh, invested in the well being of artists. Um, of course, there's that's again a, a broad generalization. There's a whole bunch of different types of commercial galleries out there. Um, but there's some places uh, I'm thinking of like Jarvis Hall Gallery. Um, they are so focused on the well-being of the artists on their roster and supporting them through their um, their work. And they're so connected to the artist-run community. I always see Shannon and Jarvis um, out at galleries, artist-run centers, um, and supporting this overall community, not just the commercial galleries. And so I think each organization, each gallery might take it differently, but there is a lot more space for kind of experimental and emergent practices within commercial galleries these days compared to um, what artist run centers might have been pushing back against more so in the 60s and 70s, um, especially at places like art fairs where it's more of a temporary installation, they might be able to um, show, show some more experimental work. Um, I still think it's really, really, really important for artists to have a space to share their practices, to share their work, to share things that maybe aren't even finished yet, but, but are in some kind of iteration or form, um, and to share their ideas with the public in, in a space that is not does not have those market pressures. And on the flip side, I think it's really, really important for audiences also to be able to experience art in a space where it's not, um, where the narrative is also not, and these are things for you to buy. Um, that artist or and audiences both have that opportunity to experience art outside of the market and think about what that means to them. Um, it's all important. And I think commercial galleries play a really, really important part in um, artists being able to make a living and um, be able to support themselves. Um, but it, 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 we just need all of these different types of spaces to support a, a broader, uh, more holistic kind of ecosystem.
And so that's probably where I'd, I'd cap it um, on artist-run centers versus commercial galleries. There's some similarities, there's a lot of differences, but I think that all in all, both are really important to our community. Well, that's, that's an awesome um, uh, sort of recap of, of the whole thing. And, it, and you brought up a lot of things that I wasn't even aware of. I mean, I knew that um, commercial galleries are becoming more, more open and they're their agendas are changing and the, the programming that they're offering is changing. Um, so I wasn't aware of that. So um, that's awesome. Um, another question I had um, regarding artist run culture is um, when you consider, um, say most artist run centers across the country um, have adopted the um, CARFAC rates um, for, for paying, paying the artists. And I know a lot of um, the artist run centers in Calgary have, have changed their programming. They used to be um, shows every month. And now the, the shows are, are longer and they have less, less shows per year so that they can offer um, um, the artists, the, the Carfac rates, and um, um, but I'm wondering if if you're aware of um, differences between the different regions. Like the the what I'm saying is the Carfac rates would sort of be an equalizer across most of the the map of Canada. In, in most cases, is sort of a generalization again, but what would you be able to tell us about the different focuses, say, between the Artist Run Network in Alberta and the Artist Run Network in, in BC or Ontario or the Maritimes or even mm. the, the far north? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, to this idea, I, I quickly want to cite um, Ladies Invitational Deadbeat Society, uh, an artist collective um, with many members that were uh, Calgary-based, um, Wilkinstis-based, um, and this idea of reducing programming to give more substantial or robust support or to meet kind of minimum fees. Um, yeah. They said something, it was a project in 2012, um, and also was uh, reprinted. It, they did they did this piece, um, this residency for 2012, and this piece also ended up in Fuse magazine for their last issue. And it it said, "Do less with less, and do more with more." Um, and I think that that's a philosophy that has really been lifted up, not only by our peers, uh, my peers in, in the community and wanting to not just spread ourselves so thin or just keep doing more projects, hoping to impress funders who are giving us less money um, in some cases, not all cases. Um, it's been em embraced by peers, I think, and for the reasons Jill has just uh, offered, but also I think it's been embraced by funders. I think funders have have seen the kind of systemic issue that has come into play um, by, uh, you know, burnout within our staff, burnout within our artistic community, oh, yes. um, poorly resourced projects that uh, contribute to that burnout, but also don't put anyone, the organization, the artist, the staff in the community in, in a better place um, or a more um, stable, stable space or in a way that we have the capacities to kind of crit critically reflect on what we're doing. Um, so I've really, really appreciated that shift um, of slowing down uh, over the past few years, several years. I mean, I mentioned that project was in 2012, but I feel like I have seen, I have seen that support and I've heard it directly from grant officers before saying, Growth, what does growth mean to you? Growth doesn't necessarily mean getting bigger, doing more programs. Sometimes it's about going deeper mm -hmm. and um, really building upon those relationships, really um, better resourcing the work you're already doing, doing that work better. Um, so that's a mantra that I really wanna thank Lids for. Um, 
and Nicole Burish, uh, Anthea Black, and um, Wednesday uh, Lupichu uh, for, for their advocacy there. Um, it, it's really formed kind of some of my um, thinking and ways of working. Um, so, sorry, going back to the kind of core of the question here, which is this idea of artist run centers and some regional differences, possibly. Um, Canada's a big place. <laughs> it is. Well, I think context is just so important. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll start there for, uh, in an attempt to answer this question because of course I am not an expert uh, in all regions across Canada or all artist-run centers even across Canada. I, I certainly know um, a number of them across the field um, mm -hmm. but their kind of inner uh, philosophies and motivations possibly not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'd like to approach this by saying that context is so integral to the work that we do. And each of us is coming to this work um, in a way uh, that is informed um, by our past experiences, by the land on which we live and find ourselves with, and the communities that we're in and serving. So mm -hmm. an example I might give is that the new gallery's philosophy and ways of working and even audiences to an extent um, are so different given our context of being in Calgary Chinatown than say even our peers of truck being in um, Sun Alta. Yeah. So the immediate communities that we find ourselves in immediately informs the work that we're doing or at least I hope it does. And so yeah, I, f I feel that that's an important, important part. And even, I think we've talked a lot about at the Alberta Association of Artist Run Centers, we've talked a lot about this past two years as we've been um, developing this national gathering of artist run centers here in Mokinstis um, called Lands to Travel Through about what, what it is about Alberta. Um, and the the project really thinks about how the artist run community here will how what we think about when we think of resources compared to what a lot of other folks outside of alberta might think about uh, when they think about the word resources in alberta and which is very much an extractive uh uh, aspect of the land uh, for en the energy um, industry, um, oil and gas sector. And so trying to share and highlight some of those pieces of what's really um, important and interesting in Alberta, which perhaps is this ability to share resources, um, this act of reciprocity, um, which I don't necessarily think is wholly unique to Alberta, but I think is something that is um, important to flag and raise up that uh, oftentimes I do hear from peers uh, in other communities who are surprised at how collaborative and collective a lot of our organizations are. Um, and we've talked a lot over since I've really um, been involved with the Alberta Association of Artist Run Centers about this idea of um, collaboration over competition um, and not having a scarcity mindset when it comes to um, things like the same streams of public funding we might be applying for. It's really, uh, yes, I guess we're technically in competition with one another, but I've never experienced that stopping any of my peers from helping one another, even if it's something like um, getting feedback on a, on a grant <laughs> proposal, um, helping collaborate or build a program together, um, giving tips and feedback on, you know, even boring things like bookkeeping, um, volunteering for one another. I, it's just, it's all very, um, very centered on reciprocity um, and peer mentorship and um, yeah, gifting knowledge. I, I certainly know that everything that I've learned, uh, not everything, I, Google helped quite a bit, but a lot of what I learned, um, especially about context was coming from my peers. And I, I've heard from other communities that 
it's not quite as collaborative, but I can't really speak to that given that my experience working in these communities has primarily been within Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'll just end with is context is everything to me, at least. It's so important. And I 100% I believe that each of these organizations in different regions probably also have nuances to the, the priorities for them based on the very specific context that they're working in. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. I guess I was imagining that there would be sort of more um, networking between the, the regional groups of artist-run centers. Like I was thinking back to the days when, way back in, in the old days when Parallelogram magazine was out and it would feature um, works from, from, um, from artist-run centers all across the country. And there was sort of more of, um, of a, a, a national collective. Um, and I think, I know, I believe there's a, um, a website now, but I haven't heard that. My, I've sort of been arm's length from, from the network for a while. I mean, I used to be in, involved a, as well um, with, with a few artist-run centers myself, but I don't get the sense that there's that, there's that much um, emphasis put on that anymore. So anyway, I appreciate what you were saying about, about context, absolutely. Yeah. That's a yeah, that's an interesting question and comment that I haven't given as much thought to because yes, there is the national organization, the Artist Run Centers and Collectives Conference, ARCA. Mm -hmm. Um and so just to give a little bit of a kind of um organizational structure view, um, we have one representative from the Alberta Association of Artist Run Centers that sits on the board of ARCA. Um, so the past few years, that's been Ginger Carlson, the director of truck. Okay. Um, I believe we just changed that representation. So, but I won't. I don't want to misspeak, so I won't um, go into that. Okay. Um, but Ginger has been uh, essentially. We meet as a group. We share things, concerns, ideas, projects, etc. And then at their quarterly meetings, I would imagine, um, Ginger reports to ARCA, as do all the other uh, pr um, provincial representatives. And so that is absolutely one way. But in terms of more of a public facing platform, as you're suggesting with Parallelogram, I know that Anne Batran, the past executive director of ARCA, was doing a series of um, digital publications, um, and there was a physical publication as well, but a series through their e-newsletter um, to kind of share best practices and learnings. And so I'll drop ARCA's link in the, in the chat as well. Um, they have a resource section of their, of their um, website, but in terms of more programming related things, they co-present the national gathering every other year. So they are a big supporter and partner with the regional caucus to be able to share that work. Um, and so that will be for us, we've postponed given COVID um, to next year for lands to travel through, which will be coming to um, Milkinstis, uh, Calgary and Alberta. Um, and so I think that's an interesting piece though, because I'm just thinking a little bit back to um, I'm trying to remember if it was the humiliation of the bureaucrat by A. a. Bronson or the second piece that he, that he did, but I think it was the first one. And he talks about this band of artist run centers across Canada being such a giant landmass um, that they they built and strengthened this network and these this collective as a kind of an outlet. Um, there were not many publications comparatively to the United States. And so like, um, like major publications. And so um, this self publishing and this net in, this network became formalized as a way to kind of um, support those communications. And this is not fully thought through, but I wonder if there's something along the lines of self-publishing and digital communications on the internet that also feed into that because Jill, you're talking about um, a really, really important publication for artist-run centers, um, but 
before it would have perhaps been really hard to get information about each of their individual projects out there. And perhaps now this is just like, you know, a theory. Um, everyone can self publish on their own website or through their own e newsletter. Yeah. Um, perhaps that has just changed the ways or the functionality of a, kind of a national organization uh, in scope like ARCA. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, parallelogram existed because there was no internet at the time. So when it, when it started. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, thank you for that. Now I think um, we'll um, dive into the part that some of these um, um, our guests have been waiting for is uh, to get into the the, the meat of um, um, what it applying to an artist run center is all about and I thought maybe you could talk about the day-to-day -day issues um, of running an artist run center and um, inviting um, applications and um, sort of the three things that I think are top most in artists minds when when they are applying to for a possible exhibition at an artist run center they're thinking about um, presentation and I know that I know that these things are all a little bit different everywhere you apply as well so we're looking for what you're looking for at the new gallery um, as well as some more general um, perspective you might be able to provide on that but we're looking at presentation um, the dreaded artist statement <laughs> and um, how juries work and what they're looking for sure yeah okay um all right so i'll give a bit of a kind of 101 on proposal writing then um sure. because that is yeah absolutely i i think a, a important important question. Um, and then I'll talk about how maybe the new galleries jury works um, and how I know some other juries might work for say, and, and some of this information is also relevant. I would, I would add to uh, grant writing. If you're writing a, a grant to a funder for your practice, that possibly is something that could carry over. Although of course, going back to the context piece, just keeping that in mind. And I guess my first tip would be, um, thinking of things like elevator pitches. Um, I don't know if anyone's given an elevator pitch before, but in my opinion, a proposal, proposal writing is essentially an elevator pitch with more details. Um, the, way, the reason I say that is because an elevator pitch, you're, you're usually speaking to a very, very specific audience. You know who the audience is and you're tailoring your pitch to that that person. And I think that that's really important for proposal writing to understand that context, understand the organization and do your research. So um, typically the proposals I see that are, are most successful know what organization they're applying to. They've looked at their recent programming. They've uh, understood, they've read and understood the mandate. And each proposal is going to be a little bit different because of this, um, even if the project is exactly the same. It's not just a copy and paste or mass email action. It's very much considering the nuance and the specificity of why this project is the right fit um, for this organization. What is the gallery, the artist run centers, or the funders purpose? Why do they exist? And can you speak to that? Is there alignment with the work that you're doing and what they're asking? Um, this can really, I think, help focus your phrasing and how you speak about the project um, and, and make sure that you're capturing your ideas that are most relevant to your reader and assuring them that there's yeah, that alignment with their goals. So I always, I always encourage folks to start by reading the calls, stop, start by reading the guidelines if there are any posted um, to make sure you're eligible and then do that research piece see what they've been programming over the past two years. Most of this information is publicly available and ready um, to be accessed. And the other thing I think is important is your time is limited um, to do this work. There are so many artist-run centers out there. There's so many different types of calls for submissions out there. 
focus your energy on the ones that are a good fit for you as an artist. You like, I talk about this elevator pitch. It's important to know your audience and, and address them in a specific way, but it's just as important that you're not compromising the integrity of your artwork to do so. So focus your energies on organizations that are actually aligned with the work that you want to be sharing. Um, focus on organizations that are aligned with your personal values. The last thing you want to do is just ap apply to every organization and take what comes your way um, and then possibly have to compromise on your work, which I certainly hope institutions aren't asking artists to do, but you never know. And so I, I just, I really encourage folks to to think about that piece before they go into writing their their submission um, and, and identify, you know, 10 organizations that you feel are a really good fit for you. Um, ARCA has a, a, a directory that allows you to search artist run centers by medium, by what they offer. Are they are they an exhibition center? Are they a production center? Are they primarily research focused, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can search by that discipline medium. Um, you can search by region, et cetera. Uh, and so I think that that's a pretty awesome tool. I don't have the link in front of me, but again, I'll, I'll drop the link in the chat at the end of uh, this talk. Um, just remind me to do so. Uh, and I, I think that that's an important kind of research step. Find the organizations that resonate with you and your art practice. Um, so the next piece uh, I would say is reach out to the programming staff, um, or if it's a grant, the funding officers. Um, if you have questions, those folks are, and, and you've already read the proposal and guidelines, don't ask questions that are already outlined there. But if you have additional questions, reach out to them. Um, these folks working at charities and nonprofits through government, arms length gov government organizations like funders, they are public servants. We are here to serve you. Um, and those folks should be happy to answer questions that you have. So I would put that out there as something really kind of an important resource that, um, yeah, I, I would say is not necessarily completely underutilized, but um, I feel like folks almost feel like they need, uh, you know, permission to do so sometimes if it's not ex explicitly put on the call. I still think you can reach out to their, their staff. Um, just look on their website under the contact page and, and find the programming staff or find whoever's listed on the call for submissions. Um, I usually, and, and getting to the specific person is important because you'll get the fastest response. Okay. okay. Another really important part of proposal writing, and please, if you want me to expand on anything, Jill, um, or you want to jump in, interject with any kind of questions, please feel free to do so, because um, I could talk at length about this. <laughs> um, so in terms of, um, in terms of uh, assumptions, clarify or articulate, challenge the assumptions you have built in within your proposal. Do not assume that the jury or the grant officer making the decision knows anything about you or the type of art that you're doing or that they're going to have capacity or time to do research beyond what you give in your proposal. Be thorough. Give that clear information. That's so, so important. Um, also try to be uh, it's integral to be outline all the details of the project while being concise. Um, I would say that, you know, typically juries are spending anywhere from 50 to 100 hours reviewing proposals and reading applications. So be respectful of their time. But also, when I say be concise, again, think about your audiences. If being poetic uh, is important to you in terms of how you describe your practice. Um, I think that that's great. And I encourage that particularly in artist run centers um, as you know, your peers are involved, but maybe for a funder, they need something a bit more didactic. I don't wanna be too prescriptive with this, um, you know, do what you need to do, but just remember who's on the other side of reading this application and how many other applications they're reading at the same time. And yeah, be true to yourself and that your practice and how you want to share your work um, while also balancing that. Okay. Um, um, so, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, um, with all that in mind, um, especially considering the fact that you said that a jury spends a lot of hours reading a lot of applications, right? Um, what do you, what would you um, 
say is really essential to um, constructing a um, an artist statement that is that is um, that's going to be effective and um, um, memorable without being you know garish or whatever but um, yeah, I guess effective and, and, and memorable and, and makes um, makes the reader want to know more. Because I've I've yeah. read plenty of artists uh, well, artists myself that, that just say, oh, not interested, right? Whereas there's so much more they could have said. Yeah. Or so much yeah. less. <laughs> well, I think it, yeah, yeah. I think it's important to speak from that place of authenticity. For me, that's where it really resonates because, you know, if you've read a lot of application, so you can immediately just see where it's just like piles upon piles of like art jargon. And you yeah. can see where it's really owning in on something that's specific and interesting uh, to the artist that they're excited and passionate about. Um, why is this an important opportunity for you as an artist? Why is this project in part important to you as an artist? Speak from what you know and what you're excited about and what you can, you can speak to authentically because there, there can be a very like clear, obvious like distinction when you're speaking from something that is just what you think a jury might want to hear versus what you actually feel and know and do. And for me, that kind of, in embodying that in the in the in the application in the artist statement in the proposal overall that's what really really hits at home for me now if you are oftentimes applications off will ask for both a proposal mm. and an artist statement yeah there's a distinction there yeah yeah so your proposals really just like what is the project? What are some of the logistical pieces? What is it comprised of? Does it have multiple projections? Does it have, do you need to hang a bunch of artwork on the wall? Do you need to wallpaper the entire space? Um, do you need to, like all of these kinds of, it, it's a proposal that kind of touches on the ideas, sure, the specificity of like the concept of the work, um, but also some of those logistical pieces. And the artist statement allows you to build upon that. Why is this type of proposal or installation um, Think of the artist statement as in dialogue, this proposal, specific proposal, in dialogue with your artistic practice. Why is this the next project you're doing in relation to the work that you've been doing? How have you been researching and developing something in, and how is it, like give me a narrative, what's the trajectory? And if it's a complete departure, why is that important to you as well? Which I think it's incredibly important to remember that we can be transparent and honest in these pieces. And I think we're, it feels like as society as a whole, we're moving towards that as a, as a method for communications. Like we need that, we need more of that vulnerability and transparent, yes. transparency and honesty in our work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Is even that how we present ourselves too. Yeah, so that's a that's a really good point. I like what you said there about how you could use the artist statement to help clarify why this project that you're proposing is an important next step in your practice overall. So that's a yeah. really good point. Very good point. Yeah, because yeah. I think that would help the artists themselves to um, contextualize what they're doing. And why, why are they even doing this so well yeah and if it's if it's if a jury has no idea about who you are or what your practice is about and they're only seeing this one piece from the proposal or your artist statement only speaks to that one piece yeah. they don't have the context of your overall kind of narrative of the work that you're doing and so giving that again going back to no assumptions do not assume that anyone uh, reading this proposal has any idea about what you're what you do even if you know people at the organization don't make that assumption they might not be on the jury try to be really really clear um yeah and it, you know tell a story artists are storytellers through our work and try to translate that into the proposal try to tell a story and make it memorable um make a compelling case for why this is not only important for you but 
an important thing for the organization to support. Um, oftentimes there's only a few exhibition slots or project slots for an artist run center. Um, a lot of these are small and mid-sized organizations. Maybe they're taking between six and 10 projects a year. Maybe they're getting a couple hundred applications. That's often what times what I see in my, in my experience. That's a pretty small percentage of um, successful applicants. And so you do want to um, be able to make that compelling case. Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, do you want me to talk about like support material or budgets or anything else like that? Um, yeah, if you, you, get if into you have some insights to share, especially if it's something that you've seen over time that um, um, that's consistent in what what you find is is um, desirable or what you find is is not. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I, well, because the support material for me really goes hand in hand with the artist statement and the proposal. Uh, going back to this idea, assume they've never seen your artwork, they don't know anything about you. So the, this documentation, the support material has to, has to show that work in its best light. What makes the most sense? Does a photo make the most sense? Does a video make the most sense? Use the method that makes the most sense and take pictures of your process as well while you're in the studio, while you're making. Um, just document if you can, if you have the tools at your disposal, even if it's just a cell phone pic, um, it's nice to have those process shots. They might be something that as you're writing your proposal or your artist statement, you can be like, oh, I talk about process a lot and maybe it's a good thing to include this in my application. And so oftentimes you go back and you're like, oh, well, I don't have any of that. I only took a picture of the work once it was done. And so consider pieces like that while you're in the studio, while you're making, while you're researching and developing. Um, if you can, I know that this, this is a barrier to some. Um, if you can, hire a professional photographer, do a trade with a photographer and uh, or ask a friend who's really great at taking images because uh, again this might be the only time that someone interfaces and sees your work and you want it to be um, to show your work in the best light um, also I see sometimes folks only include like you know two or three pictures if they give you 15 up to 15 obviously you don't want to show the same picture again and again or it's the same artwork from like 15 different angles. Um, but I think it's really important to give them as much uh, as much support material as as you can. And, and that's something that's not only um, it's not only introducing people to the work, but it's reminding them of the work. Oftentimes juries will have the work on a slideshow being shared while they're talking about the proposal. Mm -hmm. And it can be like an important reminder. Um, Tia Holiday told me a really great trick when I was talking about proposal writing to one of her classes at the UFC last year, um, where she said, you should start with it, your best image and end with your next best image, or your two best images should be on either end of the slideshow, because <laughs> that might stay on the screen uh, long enough. Um, which I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know uh, if that's true for everyone, uh, but I thought that was a really great idea nonetheless. Um, <laughs> Well, I think that it's, it makes a lot of sense, though, because the first image and the last image tend to be also what's more most memorable for us. If, if we're looking at a, a, a like a mass of stuff, that those are the things we're most likely to remember. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree. That, I agree. That's, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I guess uh, the other piece is if you have not made the work that you're pitching, try to show past work that illustrates your capacity of being successful in making this project, whether it's like, oh, you're talking about doing community engagement. Have you done any communicate community engagement before? Well, maybe share projects of that. Um, have you not made the work and it's a new process? Maybe you have some, some experimentations that you have in the studio that you can show the process, even if it's not the finished work. Um, maybe it's just a sketch or a mock-up of what you're thinking of doing. But just because you haven't made it, doesn't mean that you haven't thought about it a lot already. Doesn't mean that you haven't given this the kind of research and consideration pre prior to writing the application. And that can build a lot of confidence, I think, in a jury to to make them uh, to make folks feel like it's um, it you have the skill sets and the background to help it happen. Um, 
what's difficult, I think, for juries is when they read a proposal and an artist statement and it's completely disconnected from the work that they've shared in the support material. It's like they're doing a different they're taking a different direction in their practice, which I, I encourage if it's time for you to do something else in your work, go for it. But again, that transparency piece, explain why, um, give a little bit of insight to that transition for you. And if you have those kinds of research pieces, drafts, experiments at ha on hand, the more you can give them, the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's, that's good. Yeah. And then, oh, go ahead. It's, I was just going to say that, I mean, I've been, I've been in this, um, in this community and in, in this, I guess you could say business almost for, for about 30 years. And it's really interesting to watch how things are evolving. Like for instance, you're talking about how, how, um, vulnerability is becoming more, um, something that's, that's people look for it. People, people desire it, people respond to it. Whereas that used to be discouraged in, in preparing an artist statement or, or a, a proposal. And now it's, it's encouraged. And I'm, I'm finding that, that really interesting. Like it's people want to know about your experience. They want to know uh, um, more about your life. Yes. And, and um, so that's an interesting evolution all in itself. Yeah. On one hand, I feel like there has been, you know, um, a lot of conversations about pushing back against the professionalization of the artist. I think that there's been a lot of conversations about just acknowledging that the artist often has to do all of these other, they have to market themselves, they have to write their own grants, they have to be their own publicist, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that I feel like there's been a pushing back against, against that. Um, and just let artists be artists. And, you know, I'm giving you some tips here based on my experience, but I also don't think that there's a formula for the perfect proposal mm -hmm. or application. I think that it really depends. It, it's going to be so based on who you're applying to, what your work and your priorities are and your projects are, the time of like the, the time of year and day, like it, you have to take into consideration all of these things. You know, I, mm -hmm. I know some folks might like after a major cultural or social event might wake up the next day and need to completely change their kind of way of thinking. I, I think we, we've seen a lot of that this year. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, especially with, you know, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement um, and the calls for institutions to be accountable and uh, on being equitable to our communities um, and to our equity seeking groups. Um, so things can can really I, you just have to be paying attention, I think. I think you have to be responsive and you can't have a document that you just is a final piece that you feel perfectly summarizes your project that you then mass email to everyone across the board because it takes out i think a lot of the care and the nuance that your artistic practice deserves when you're speaking about it and these organizations also i think deserve like it it it, it is about having a conversation and building a relationship it it can't be as cold as just quite kind of copy paste send right, right. yeah it's which is yeah. refreshing nice yeah and that's actually a good segue to my next question um and you've already started touching on it a bit i think is what would you say um is the is the future of the artist run center um, and I'll, I'll i'll put that a little bit more context to that question too um now this this information i'm talking about right now was totally before COVID happened. I mean, COVID brings in a whole other, whole new um, era of considering how all of this works. But even before that, even a few years ago, um, I read articles where people were saying that the artist run center model is dead or it's on its way out. And I can't see that happening anytime soon, but I can certainly see it evolving and changing. So I wondered if you had any comments about that. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I remember many of those articles, and I think it, it it's important for our community to continually in challenge um, 
our institutions and our institutional models and the status quo and what we think should continue. Um, so, yeah, I feel like there was a lot of these conversations, particularly at the Vancouver Institutions by Artists um, conference gathering back in 2012. Um, and that was one of the national gatherings uh, co-hosted by ARCA and then the uh, PARC, which is the regional association out there. Um, ARCA? Can't remember their exact acronym off the top of my head. Um, but I, I absolutely, I absolutely um, remember how I mean, I was very green and early in my in my work at that stage, but how exciting that conversation was. Um, and what what is the future of artist run centers? Well, I think it is about that continual challenging of the status quo and the and the institutional structure. Um, I find a lot of conversations today uh, are are thinking about what needs to change or what can change. And I've seen a lot of incredible peers. I'm thinking about people like, um, well, Untitled right here in Mulkinstis or 221A uh, in Vancouver, um, who are doing some in really incredible work within their kind of artist run organization. That's, they're, they're still involving artists, artists are still at the center, but the way that they're, thinking about their roles in community is incredibly different. The way that they're thinking outside of the gallery, if they are a presenting organization, or the way that they work with artists is incredibly different. 221A has a uh, really interesting fellowship program where um, essentially working on different types of infrastructures and frameworks for um, building a better world and thinking about like uh, how, how artists are intersecting with all of these other um, important social issues that, and, and that we're not in a silo, that we're not this kind of, um, I mean, to borrow from academia, ivory tower, uh, white cube situation, but um, which is certainly my, my interest and my mandate is not just working within, within the gallery, but working within community and thinking about, you know, we talk a lot about at the new gallery, how art is um, a way to share uh, these key issues of our time to communities and educate through art. But how can artists also be involved more actively uh, in addition to just advocating, advo not that advocating isn't uh, hugely important, but how are artists involved in social change as well? And I think we've seen a fair bit of that this year. Um, but I, I'm interested in artists, uh, the artists run model, the future of artists run centers, essentially um, expanding to not just be what we consider an artist run center and kind of the the canon of um, recent day uh, Canadian history, just from the more, uh, from like recent years, sorry, I can't speak right there. Um, but not just this idea of like the artist run center from the sixties and seventies and that model, but how are artists involved in all of our organizations, all of our kind of civic conversations. And I'm interested in how artist run centers kind of can expand to advocate for that. I'm interested in how artist run centers can have individuals and, um, partnerships and collaborations with folks outside of the arts community, um, where we're still, you know, focused on making art and still focused with presenting and sharing art, um, but also involved in broader discussions and, and that the, the, those contributions are valued. So in terms of the future of artist run centers, that's only my interest. And so what I would say is the future of artist run centers is going to be dependent on who's involved. Mm -hmm. um, and right now we know a lot of people aren't involved. We know that like many other institution models, uh, artist run centers are predominantly white. Um, and we know that that needs to change. So I hope the future of artist run centers um, is more relevant in our makeup on our boards and our staff. Um, and I hope that the future of artist run centers is informed by those 
perspectives that have been historically ex excluded, um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, have systemically been excluded uh, by um, by the institutional model and by society at large. And so I, I hope that that can inform what those that vision looks like because. At the end of the day, artist run centers change what they do all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends on who's involved at, at that moment. Absolutely. And, and it's really about the folks who are involved and in contributing uh, as volunteers, as board members, as committee members, as staff, as members, as, as the membership. A lot of us in Alberta have our membership model. Mm -hmm. um, those are the folks who, who determine that path. And uh, it's gonna be different, I think, for every single one of those artist run centers finding out what, what the future means to them. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. I think you've already answered my, my last question was to um, ask you what you would like to see. And I think you have addressed that. Um, but before we go and see if there are any other questions from, um, from viewers here, I thought I would um, put it to you to see if you have anything else you would like to add to this to this talk that um, I haven't asked you. Hmm. Or if you'd like to add more to like what you would like to see. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe I'll just end with. Um, I think it's important that we acknowledge and honor our histories. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's important that we feel beholden to continuing them if they no longer serve our needs. And I'm not talking necessarily about completely like flattening multiple organizations. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about reflecting on how we are or aren't serving um, our communities anymore. And to really, really be open as a community to changing what what these organizations what artist run centers do so that we can be responsive and better serve communities today the whole point of artist run centers and having artists at the center of an organization allows us to or in theory is supposed to help organ these artist run centers respond to the needs of our community if that's uh if that's not happening we need to kind of challenge what are some of our assumptions here what are what are some of the things that we we think are uh important that we've been holding on to for in some cases 40 plus years mm -hmm. that we no longer need to hold on to mm -hmm. so that we can move our support or resources towards things that are important today um and yeah i think when you're dealing with these these organizations artist run centers have these long histories now um, sometimes I think folks can feel like they're tiptoeing around, like not wanting to, um, let go of something that is really, really important, uh, or has been important historically to an organization. Mm -hmm. And I think that things can have served their purpose and you can move on, um, without forgetting them and without forgetting to honor, um, where you came from those all of those who have contributed countless uh hours ideas and pathways forward in the future um so i think i would end there thanks great well thank you so much sue that is uh wow you've given us a lot to think about me anyway <laughs> really appreciate that a lot and um yeah just your your perspective absolutely um jackie are there questions um so far no one sent me anything um but i guess we can open it up to the floor as it were yeah. if people have anything to say um Absolutely. yeah so we can do that sure yeah does um, anybody here in the in the room have any questions for sue And thank you, Jackie, for uh, putting all the links in the chat. That's great. Um, so yes, please do check those out at your on your own time. And I think that there's some really excellent resources there. Yeah, um, if you could actually send me more, if you have any more, I can send them out. Sure. With, um, I usually do a survey after if people are okay with that. So <laughs> I can include those. Um, Absolutely. 
Yeah, I'll try to pull some up right now. Um, just giving people a sec, one more minute or so to stew on if they have any additional questions. I'm always one of those people that uh, I need like a few hours to think right. after a talk. And then I'm like, oh, now I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have a comment to make about what the, that last bit that you were talking about. It just sort of popped into my head. And um, when I was uh, scrolling through Instagram the other day, I ran across um, just something really quickly. I don't know why I didn't look further. I think maybe I got a phone call or something because I was like, wow, um, there is apparently um, a totally indigenous run, artist run center in Montreal that has just opened. And Daphne. What's that? Daphne. Yes, Daphne. I was going to say it has one name and sort of a, a quirky name, but it's like, wow, it's like... Um, it really makes me wonder um, what what we're going to learn from what kind of a, a model they create. I'm yeah. very curious what they're going to do with this. You know? Absolutely. Well, and what I'll say already is um, from Otsitsiwan in Edmonton, I feel so humbled for their generous sharing and learnings. Um, as a peer artist run center uh, that is indigenous led here in, oh, in Alberta. I didn't, I didn't know about that one. That's great. They just opened their building. Well, they opened it in March when the pandemic hit. So they just oh, actually, yeah. they didn't actually open to the public. They finished their new building mm -hmm. um, and they just opened a show in the fall um, for folks to have their chance to see. Um, they're an incredible, incredible organization um, with some incredible humans involved. Becca Taylor, their director, is, uh, I'm learning so much for her, from her and I'm really grateful for her contributions um, to the artist run conversation here uh, in Alberta and beyond. And um, I would say just uh, support them if you can. Um, uh, they're an uh, emerging organization, and uh, if you're if you have resources to donate, I would encourage you to do so. What are um, they called again? What is their name? They're called Otsitsiwan. I'll drop their link in the chat too. It's O C I C I W A N. Okay. Um, here's that directory I was talking about that I'll just pop in the chat there. Sure. Um, Otsitsiwan. Okay, and then here's Otsitsiwan. Yeah. Let's see if you want. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Well, if anyone has questions after the talk, you can feel free to also send me an email, throw my email in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes on the spot it can be difficult, but um, again, I just want to say that I really, really appreciate you all being here today, spending your lunch hour with me. Um, and also, of course, so appreciative of EAR, all the work you all do. Another great organization to donate to if you have uh, the resources on hand. Um, always really appreciative of the work that Elephant Artist Relief does to um, be able to support our artist community in some really, really fundamental ways. Oh, thank, thank you, you so, so much, Sue. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, if anyone, uh, just to iterate for our relief funds, if anyone is facing a financial crisis, you can always visit elephantartistrelief.com and you can apply for our funding. Um, that's ongoing. There's no deadline. So just want to make sure everyone's always aware that's our main goal. But we also have a upcoming, uh, our final Umbrella Talks event for this fall. It's in December. Um, the date has to be finalized, but we're interviewing three separate artists. Um, from Calgary and area. So hopefully you guys can join us then too. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you're not connected with um, with us on social media, you can find us on, on Facebook at Elephant Artist Relief. And or is it Elephant Artist Relief Society? Anyway, you'll find it. Yeah. And um, <laughs> on Instagram, we are Ear is for Artists. And um, uh, Twitter, not too much activity on Twitter, but I, I think it's the it. elephant. It's not just uh, no, it's not just. I think elephant. it's elephant art. I'm not Is sure. It elephant art. Okay. Yeah. But um, Instagram and uh, and Facebook are are the big ones. Besides our our website, where um, you'll receive 
you'll receive oh, activate fun codes i forgot as well these videos yes. are actually available on youtube now we do have a new yes. youtube page which That's i've been very cool slowly being creating <laughs> over the last yes. few months so please visit you can see our previous umbrella talks um and they're all really cool so i'd really recommend go seeing them and our elephant artist relief society is our um youtube name otherwise you'll find elephants painting things so <laughs> awesome uh, i don't have anything else to add um does anyone else katie sue the crowd no just oh. thank you <laughs> awesome sauce all right um well i hope you have a good day sue and for everyone else to have a good day and everyone to stay healthy hopefully yes um, please stay safe and stay healthy and wear your masks. Please. <laughs> please. All right. Um, wear your mask. I'm going to end the conversation. So hopefully everyone does well.